Welcome to the big British castle It's time for Adam and Joe to broadcast on the radio There'll be some music and some random talking in between And then eventually the whole thing will just end well, there we go. That's uh, Zero by the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Very nice to have you along. Nice to have you along. Welcome to the smooth sounds. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking that, you know, Bobby Friction was on just then. He was very professional, wasn't he? And he was actually creating friction by jiggling around in his chair. We were yeah. watching him through the glass. It's like he had some sort of a coffee buzz on. He was jiggling up and down in his chair. That's why they call him Mr. Friction. Yeah, creating some a static charge. So I thought that we would be, you know, like the smooth guys. Mm -hmm. We've got a name for people who <laughs> listen to the show this early in the morning, don't we? Yes, uh, they're called Black Squadron. Mm, they're yeah. an elite group. I was thinking, though, uh, good morning, Black Squadron uh, members, I was thinking that if, if one were to say something like that, you know, good morning, Black Squadron members, you might start sounding a bit like Noel Edmonds on Deal or No Deal, <laughs> when he says, hello, West Wing, hello, East Wing, you know, he starts naming the studio audience. Oh, does he? And it gets quite, I mean, it makes you want to punch Edmonds. This lots is of thing, things, lots of things have that effect, but that's one of the strongest ones. Well, as soon as people start talking about little cliques and gangs and things mm. that they're into, it's, it's trouble, isn't it? And you're not into them yet. You do want to punch them. Yeah. So I had another idea um, that we would change the name of Black Squadron every morning. Right. You know, like you change a password to a fortress in case the enemy get it. Like they do in Harry Potter, the portrait hole. Yes, the portrait hole. <laughs> you portrait hole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think that would be good? Then you would have... Uh, no, that wouldn't work, would it? Because then if you just listened to one show at the very beginning, mm. you'd immediately know the password. It would no, be confusing. Work. Also, the other thing is I've done a jingle for Black Squadron. Oh. So I would well, have to do everything. a jingle every week yeah. for the newly named wouldn't be Squadron. Right. So Black Squadron, uh, that's all of you listening now. Stand to attention. Here's your jingle. the beginning of the show black squadron don't want to miss a thing that's, that's not, not the way black squadron roll black went to bed at a reasonable hour gotta be sharp on saturday morning that's the secret of the squadron's power black squadron so that's there you, good. There you go. That's the Black Squadron jingle. You are all members of Black Squadron. Anyone listening uh, to the beginning of the show? I'm going to command Black Squadron in a second. Are you? I'm going to give them a command, and, and they must all follow the command. Wow. Black Squadron, eat fruit! They, they must all now eat some fruit. What if they haven't got any fruit? They have to find some fruit quickly, otherwise they're kicked out of the squadron. Oh, my goodness. Oh they have to go to, the, goodness. go to their shops, or just if they've... Everyone's got some fruit around, haven't they? Yeah, but what if they've just got a big eat fruit. bowl of mouldy old fruit? They have to, to eat it. You have to eat, eat mouldy fruit. Yeah. That's the way it goes in Black Squadron. It's tough, man. It's a tough unit. It's an elite unit. We had a couple of um, messages from people in the week. We had a wonderful Black Squadron logo designed mm. for us, which we should get made into badges. Surely. Surely we should. You know, like, to make it properly like Swap Shop or something. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> well, let's have some talks about that. Uh, that was, let's see, who is it that created the badges? Um, they also want to be invited to the Nectar Points Party. Right, so we're going to Well, we have need to talk about that a bit later. The Points Party. Uh, also, there's a Facebook page now for Black Squadron which was created last Saturday. It's got five members, Joe. That's a lot of members. And that's a lot. That's of an elite squadron. The fewer members there, there are, the more elite the squadron is. And that's a good thing. I mean, that's a... Well, that's, at the very least, that's but a family one. I read that email and I was thinking, uh, you know, what kind of criteria do you need to join the... Fa I mean, anyone could join the Facebook page. How do they test whether they've actually listened to the first bit of the show? You wouldn't lie about that kind of thing, would you? Well, one would hope not. I mean, that would be grotesque. It'd be really sordid. That was Chris informing us about the Facebook page. And I've managed to... Oh, no, it's Michael and Joanne in Enfield. Who did the amazing logo. I think they created the logo. Good I, work. I think I'm right about that. So, uh, welcome, Black Squadron. We'll be signing you out at 9.30, just before the news with the special uh, Stand Down jingle. But right now, here's some more music for you. This is um, Ben Folds 5. Uh, the Fruit Command has confused 
quite a lot of Black Squadron. <laughs> Some of them don't have any fruit, asking whether a Jaffa cake will suffice. Well, yes. Some are allergic to fruit. Some are... Uh, yeah, Why did some... you command Black Squadron to eat fruit? Well, I was thinking what a thing a thing that everyone could probably achieve. Well, what about... What, about what you didn't want to do anything physical in case people were incapacitated mm. or something like mm. that? I did put some thought into it. I thought everyone's got a little, bo- little bowl of fruit. <laughs> can have some fruit. Well, obviously you were wrong. I was wrong. I'm proved completely wrong. Allergic to fruit. Does avocado count? Oh, dear. <laughs> avocado. Well, you can have an avocado pear. Mm. So I would say that, yes, it does count. I'd say marmalade. Anything with a fruiting. Well, listen, we'll make the commands broader and longer in future. Anything with fruit in it or, yeah. like, a fruit flavour. It can be stuff like, yeah, we'll think of something else. <laughs> it doesn't say much for Black Squadron's power, though. So far. <laughs> so far, Black Squadron have managed to fall at the very first hurdle. They've got very confused. About <laughs> and it wasn't a massive they, hurdle. They didn't have time to prepare, though, did they? I mean, I'm sure we Well, would've... that's what it's about, being in the squadron, isn't it? You know, it's true. It's you don't true. have, like, next week, squadron, <laughs> just to give you a heads up. Yeah. There might be a command. Here's a clue. It might involve fruit. So have some fruit around. <laughs> Okay. Do you think that happens in the SAS when they give an SAS unit a command? Sorry, I can't. I'm allergic to fighting. Yeah, exa- well, it does. Uh, nowadays, Joe. Now it's, exactly it does. Right. Sorry, against, against health and safety. Exactly, rules. health and safety. Oh, I can't do that, Sergeant. I'm feeling a little... I've got a bit of a cold today, <laughs> so I can't. Sorry. I'd love yeah. to help you, but I can't go storming that emplacement. Is that what they call it? Yeah, an emplacement. Yeah. I can't yeah. storm the emplacement. I'm, yeah. I'm feeling a bit wheezy. Yeah. So I'm going to have to sit this one out. So yeah, I can't... No, I'm allergic to guns of never own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we can't do it. You're rolling with a jargon. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't want to take the um, tank across the <laughs> that's bridge. That's good jargon. Tank. <laughs> <laughs> you, have you been in the army? Yes. I yeah, drove a tank. No, it really shows. I drove a tank. Um, and uh, I was, you know, I was driving the tank that Margaret Thatcher went in that time. Right. Do you remember? Yeah. When she was showing off about tanks and yep. she had that headscarf she on. She was always in a tank. That was the good old days. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play you some music from the good old days right now. Do you remember Uberman? No. You don't remember Uberman? No. From the 90s? Is it a film? Uh, no, they were a band. Oh. And, uh, oh, they were big, man. Really big in the 90s and... The lead singer, uh, Ron Johns, he slept <laughs> Run, Run Johns. nearby Justine Frischman one time. and What was he called? Ron Johns? Ron Johns. And, uh, Is that his real name? I don't know. And Pinto, the drummer, he pushed Andy Peters off a ledge and uh, Tanya posed nudes right. for the was cover. Was the bassist called Storage? Exactly. Yeah, I now you remember. remember. Storage, Pinto, Ron Johns. And Tanya. <laughs> and Tanya. Yes. Uberman. She posed nude for Now Music Now Now Music Now 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 Music magazine. Great mag. Anyway, um, it's a shame that people don't remember them more because they were a good band. And I'm mm. going to play a track from Uberman right now. I'm, I don't know if those facts are true, incidentally, stupid listeners. I, I made Would you up. just call the listeners stupid? No, I was talking to the stupid community. Right. Well, those listeners who are, who are, who are aware and comfortable with the fact that they're stupid. Yeah. I count myself. <laughs> What's that squadron? Stupid squadron. <laughs> I'm the commander of that squadron. <laughs> That's my own private crack force. Oh, I bet they've got access to fruit. <laughs> yeah, they got loads of fruit. So listen, um, stupid squadron. This is for you. This is Uberman. There's going to be a logo for that now. No, come and a on. jingle. How many squadrons can one show take? A lot. <laughs> because then we'd be armed to the teeth, and we could take all comers. Just the whole half hour would just be squadron <laughs> shout outs. <laughs> it would make it easier, wouldn't it? People in the army like this show, you know. They do. Well, it gives them a sense of order. We've got a couple of messages from guys in the in the, the navy forces. boats, yeah. and. Um, you know, we're not snubbing you by not getting back to you. We haven't got postcards. We're going to get postcards soon, right? And then, like, pictures and stuff that to send out. That we send out, yeah. So then it's all, we're going to be on top of it. So anyway, listen, Uberman, this is a lovely track. I hope you enjoy it. It's called Dolphin Blue. Well, I'd be more inclined to talk to you if you stop shouting at me. That was the new single from Peaches Geldof, Talk To Me. <laughs> it's only a matter of time, isn't it? Before we play the new single by Peaches Geldof? Absolutely, yeah. I'll be excited, that would be a great day. It would be a good, it's bound to be a good song. It's bound to be a great song. Uh, this is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. I went for an audition yesterday, Ooh, Joe. Yeah. And uh, as an actor, an actor. As an actor, yeah, it's one of one of the things I do, you know. Do it's one of the, of the many strings to your bow. Many, many strings to my polymathic bow. And I uh, went along to the audition and it was really enjoyable now most auditions are not in any way enjoyable 
But this one was nice because the people for whom I was auditioning were not in the room. They were all over in America. So I was just going on tape, right? Yeah. And the guy that was putting me on tape was a fan of this show. Hey. So it was really nice. He was very smiley and um, put me at ease and, you know, just relaxed me. And it was a very enjoyable process just reading through a few scenes with him uh, at the camera. What kind of thing was it for? I can't really tell you. I can't say. No. Uh, it was for a remake of Filofax, but don't tell anyone. It's a good idea. Uh, you know, and it's an, it's an updated remake of the uh, Jim Belushi film Filofax. Right. But for the Blackberry generation. Mm. And they've already had to do a lot of updates because Blackberries are a bit yesterday. Mm. What would it mm. be now, then? It would be the iPhoneofax. Yeah, something like that. Anyway... So that's what I was auditioning for. So that was a nice audition, right? But most of the auditions that I've been to, and I'm sure most actors would agree, are absolutely horrific and painful, and one that particularly sticks in my head. And I was thinking that this might be a possible textination topic, right? Mm -hmm. Bad, uh, not just bad auditions, but bad job interviews in general. Times where you've been on the spot and, and really had a chance to prove yourself and mm. show your worth, and it's gone disastrously wrong. And, you know, half the business of doing an interview or being an, an actor and doing an audition is, is confidence, right? That's the, that's the majority of the battle is to do with just being confident enough to bluff your way through the process and make a good first impression. I'm not very good at that kind of thing. Mm. Are you good at that? Very, very good. Are you very, very, very good? good at it, yeah. <laughs> so usually what I do is I go in there and I stumble and stutter and make excuses. And that's not very good, especially if you're an actor and I remember one time I went for an audition for a TV drama, sort of a comedy drama thing. This is a few years ago. And the, uh, there, there was a panel of three quite severe looking ladies who were auditioning me. And uh, I sort of sat down and they don't and they don't give you any points. They don't put uh, in this uh, in this occasion, they didn't put me at ease at all. Right. Mm. They weren't like being smiley or anything like that. So I just uh, sat down and I said, right, OK, uh, they asked me to prepare a couple of scenes. I said, right, um, I'll just start. Uh, I'll start reading. Then shall I just go into the, the first scene and, uh, you know, do a fairly straight, boring read. And then you can sort of direct me from there. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the woman said, oh, well, it's always very exciting when an actor promises a boring read. I said, oh, ooh, right. Ooh. So immediately I'm like, okay, probably a bad thing to say. Shouldn't have said uh, boring, no jokes. Okay, right. <clears throat> so I go into the first scene, and uh, she and there's a lot of stage direction, right? The stage direction being the bits where it says, uh, then the character crosses over to the room and picks up a bucket. Blah blah blah. Usually in auditions, the casting people. Scene read them for you i mean this is a great this is the bucket yeah. scene it was jack and jill the movie yeah yeah it's a good movie <laughs> but they didn't read the stage directions right mm. so i was sort of waiting for them to read the stage direction and getting confused and i was all like on the back foot right it was all frightening oh, god then we get to another scene which is shall i say a love scene a physical mm. scene and it's and most of the stage direction in this is all saucy stage direction about yes. what's going on between the couple so and there's not very much dialogue at all. What sort of a film was this you were auditioning for? It's a grown-up adult uh, project. <laughs> and wouldn't have thought acting was one of the key skills necessary. Well, no, I mean, no. Yeah. So I talked my way through the scene, and I sort of, I was sort of saying out loud, "Well, uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll say that I'll say the dialogue bits in this scene, but I mean, obviously, a lot of it's stage direction and 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 physical, and and they weren't giving me any help whatsoever. So I just sort of say, uh, okay." Um, Mm, oh yes yes uh oh that's so good etc and then <laughs> he goes over and you know they're lying on the bed the couple and i'm sort of speaking the stage directions right. right so i get to the end of this very awkward scene and i say well there you go uh did my best it's uh obviously very difficult to you know um conjure the uh conjure the uh scene without you know an another actual person there and and the woman says, yes, um, well, you could have used acting. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, you see, you've never had any formal acting training. No. And actors get trained, <laughs> I would imagine, how to deal with audition situations. I think that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, they do. There are, there are things that are agreed between proper actors and those who are auditioning proper actors, ways to approach situations like that, that, that you and I aren't privy to. No. Thereby, you making a phenomenal tool of yourself. <laughs> 
That's been, that'll be the reason why you look like a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking like, you know, even if Danny Craig had been here, right? I call no, him Danny. Danny Craig. He, you reckon he would have yeah. been? He, he was, um, he's a proper actor. He's a trained right. actor. He would have known exactly how to do that. So a trained actor would have leapt up from their seat. Yes, started... it would have been as if there was a second person in the room. He yeah. would have just made empty space become a person. Stripped off all his the clothes. skills of mime. You know, even someone like David Bowie can make himself appear to be trapped in a glass box yeah. when there is no such box. Even I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can make it look like I'm pulling a rope. Look. Yeah. Wow. Like, now that actually does look, I'm doing a rope pulling. That does look like there's a rope there, right? Now I'm confused. Is there really a rope? or look, it's rope wow. resisting. You I see? wish you could see this, listeners. It's amazing. Now it's you, like he's pulling a rope. Yeah, I'm a good mime artist. You could just extrapolate that into a person easily like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then start pretending to to get get That's the key jiggy action. with them. Oh, I'm not going to I'm not going to translate no. that action for the listeners. But it was very humiliating, and and it was the closest I've ever come to standing up in an audition and just saying, you know what, lady face, you can keep your audition and and you can go off somewhere. And so we're asking the listeners. Sorry, I'm because yeah. we're just coming up to the news. We're asking the listeners to send us for text the nation uh, their experiences of auditions or job interviews. If yeah, you, if you're not an actor or kind of any any, can we broaden it even more? Any situation, any just any situation. <laughs> <laughs> Text the nation is just situation. Yeah, no, it's it's job no, interviews, it's specifically and, job interviews, and auditions, and, and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, when you've made a complete fool of yourself. Um, but now it's time for well, the hang news, on, we've got to sign out Black Squadron first. Oh, sign out Black Squadron, Ben. Hey, Black Squadron! Stand down, your work is done. You've earned yourself a nice warm bath and maybe a nice little bun. And don't forget, the text number is 64046. You can also uh, interact with Text the Nation via email, adamandjoe.sixmusic at bbc.co.uk. It's time for the news. That was Bat for Lashes with Daniel. Very nice indeed. She sounds as if she's been listening to Fleetwood Mac. Maybe she has. That wouldn't be an uncool thing to do. But like late period, uncool Fleetwood Mac. Right, that would be a less cool thing to do. But it's nice, though. She's turned it into a delicious soup. She's very beautiful and talented. And she makes very good videos, doesn't she? Natasha Khan. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly. I wonder what the one for that one. Oh, that's an old one, isn't it? Daniel. Uh, isn't it? Is that, no, that's new, I think. We played it before. I don't think it's yeah. super fresh. Wow. Off the vine, Define, I'm speaking. I mean, it's still yeah. fresh. It's just not super freshly plucked. It wasn't. It, she didn't record it yesterday. No, and that's the kind of thing we like to play <laughs> it on Six Music. It's new, brand new music and <laughs> yeah. old music. Exactly. And Adam and Joe here on uh, BBC Six Music, incidentally. Now, I got a little confused. I get confused quite easily. But when I was cycling along the other day on the side of a bus, I saw an advert for Fast and Furious. Yes. And... So I was thinking, what, is that to do with The Fast and The Furious, the Vin Diesel film with cars in it? Mm. And it turns out it is, Yeah. but it's just another instalment. In fact, it's the fourth instalment. Is it the fourth? In the franchise, yeah. The first was The Fast and The Furious. Yeah. The second was Too Fast, Too, too Furious, Furious, wasn't it? Yeah. Then it was, was the third <clears throat> one. Was that Tokyo Drift? Yes, correct. Uh, and now it's gone back to just Fast and Furious. So all they've yeah, done Fast is... Fast and Furious. They've just dropped the definite article. It's a brilliant, yeah, new direction in the naming of sequels, which is a tricky business. They've got Diesel back, dropped the definite article, yeah. job done. Say there was a film called Sausage. Yeah. The first film would be called Sausage. The second film would be called... No, the first... You know, the second film would be called Sausage Returns. Right. Yeah. It's usually this is how they Return do it. Return of the Sausage. Mm, that's kind of in the 80s. Now, really? Now, yeah, now it would be Sausage Returns. Back the Sausage. Third film might be <laughs> back, Third film might be Sausages. Yeah. And then once they'd exhausted the whole Sausage franchise, they'd go back to Sausage Begins. Right. You know, isn't that the logic? Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. The and contemporary then sequel naming logic. Mo Sausages. Mo Better Sausages. Yeah. Delicious Mo a, Sausages. Uh, jazz Sausage yeah, that film. Would be well, I was thinking for Fast and Furious, because obviously they're in it for the long run, right? Mm. So this is the fourth instalment, Fast and Furious, just drop the definite article. Fifth instalment, and let me tell you that the plot, do you know the, pr the plot of Fast and Furious? Probably involves two macho men mm -hmm. who get in some kind of a brouhaha. Brouhaha. And have to race each other in a dangerous area to see who's the best one. Wow, it's weird. It's like you've seen the film. Yeah. 
I have, I've, I have seen the first three, actually. Well, Vin, no. You've seen yeah. Tokyo Drift. Yeah, no. I've seen Tokyo Drift. Tokyo Drift has got some amazing footage of a car chase through Shibuya. Yeah. It's got some amazing footage of Tokyo. That uh, lasts about 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Right. <laughs> Rest of it, unwatchable. Yeah. Dog box, rubbish, <laughs> uh, cat litter, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Dog nonsense. Mm. Uh, well, this one, as you say, includes... It's got Vin Diesel, Paul Walker, Michelle Rodriguez, and, oh. and Jordana Brewster. Oh, Jordana Brewster? Yeah, I'm she's glad to brilliant. say she's involved. They're all back, and they pick up where they left off, apparently. Yes. Uh, Diesel plays Dom, an ex-con who's mm. still bitter at undercover cop Brian, played tell, by Paul Walker. Tell me something I don't already know. But soon, the pair join forces to investigate the death of a mutual associate. Yes. Right, so here's what I'm thinking. In the fifth instalment, right, that's just called Fastifur. 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 Mm. Right? And well, that would then, it would spell fast fur. Yes. And then what? Uh, so ah, it sounds like some ooh, sort of animal ah, Exactly. Ah, it's a greyhound. Exactly. It's a greyhound based race film. This is a good film. No, it's that's not greyhounds. Oh. But that would be good. Greyhounds racing through, through Tokyo. Yeah, but it doesn't. Wow, imagine it, the skidding. My idea is horses, right? Knocking because, over bins. Yeah. They could knock over no, a bin. Horses. And all that trash could roll Horses! The Sorry, horses. Right. Fast fur. It's Vin Diesel, an ex con. He's still very bitter, but now he's uh, decided to join, for, join horses, not forces. <laughs> 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 yeah? You're happy with that, aren't you? Well, not so much now that you ruined it <laughs> by going on about greyhounds. But horses is good. They join horses. They join horses. So what, they breed some kind of weird Siamese horse with eight legs. Oh, yeah, they go and investigate be some worth fields. paying money to see. All right, listen. The sixth instalment. Right. <laughs> the sequel to Fast and Fur. Fast Fur. Fast Fur. Is just called Fafu. And Fafu. Fafu. And it stars Vin Diesel again as an ex-con who, who now fancies the undercover cop, Brian. And soon the pair join forces to investigate each other. <clears throat> right sounds like an, a homoerotic thriller exactly right <laughs> exactly right by that time that'll be fashionable culture will have come around to uh i'm man, waiting for man love exactly is, is, is and i think D- diesel will absolutely he'll jump in there he'll be keen fill the gap very nicely what about what if they do a, just a film called the the and the because mm. they're left over from the earlier film aren't they that could be a spin-off though yeah <laughs> <laughs> the and the what would that be about that would be about uh, all the people waiting at the start and finish line of the race. What they do, the extras. Yeah, what happens to all the extras yeah. in the film? Yeah, uh, but, but I was thinking the final instalment, right? It's just called. That's good. And it's uh, Vin Diesel. He's an ex-con. He's so bitter at mm-hmm. undercover cop Brian, who he no longer fancies, that he lets the air out of his tires. <laughs> and he and it takes ninety minutes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good film idea. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. I thought it all through. You're pretty yeah. impressed. I you're did some... you're a d- at least a double threat. I mean, the acting, yeah. the writing, yeah. the ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. Come on, Hollywood. It's waiting for you in a little, in a little buckles bag. <laughs> a little brown waiting bag. Waiting to be picked up at the Lost Property Office. Speaking of bags, Hollywood. here's James Brown. That is a young man. He's called James Brown. He dances like a kind of chicken, like mm. a funky... Can you imagine a funky chicken? Sounds disgraceful. Well, that's what he does. And uh, that's called Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. And this is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. I wouldn't let my kids listen to that. Why not? Uh, it just sounds corrupting. Right, given the bad... I'd give, like to live in a town where dancing was banned. I agree with you. Yeah? Because that kind of music, generally, it speaks to what part of the body? The devil part. The loins. The loin area. I think uh, dancing should be banned. If kids want to dance, they should go to some sort of uh, sawmill on the outskirts of town mm. and dance alone. Exactly. And, yeah, do, do... What's it called? Punch dancing. It's called, yeah, the footloose. That's right. Uh, either that or just listen to music which is impossible to dance to, like, I don't know, Star, Star Sailor. <laughs> <or something like. laughs> music for the for the heart and the head rather than the groin. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. What, trying to dance to music that's not danceable to, like a very slow, um, moody radio head number or something. Something like that, yeah. 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 It's fun to dance to that kind of thing. <laughs> you reckon, if you <laughs> well, try? it becomes interpretive dance more, doesn't it? Right. Just making shapes with your body and... 
swaying with your hands. When's that kind of thing going to come back in? Because at the moment, it's all very, you know, sort of... Uh, what, how do people dance generally? Absolutely no idea. I've not seen anyone <laughs> dancing for the last 10 yeah, years. Let's get off the subject. <laughs> <laughs> We've forgotten. <laughs> did you used to do... Into- did you used to do, like, uh, you know, miming all the words in the song on the yes. dance floor? Yes. To cover up the fact that you can't actually dance, you do some yeah, comedy that's dancing. That's the easiest thing to do, just to pretend you're singing it. Exactly. That's the best get-out clause for dancing. I, now I've got a very vivid memory of standing in a little circle of people, thinking that we were so funny, acting out all the words of the song that we were dancing that's to. That's the thing to do. Good times! Great times. <laughs> Brilliant. Listen, here's a free play from me. Is it now? Yeah, this is uh, Cornelius with i think it's from the album point isn't it this is his cover of, great album. of brazil this is very nice uh now i'm should we have the text the nation jingle there ben text the nation text 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 the nation what if i don't want to text the nation but i'm using email is that a problem it doesn't matter text text the nation this week is all about disastrous auditions stroke job interviews that you have experienced maybe ways that Either things have gone wrong for you in that situation, or perhaps ways that you've tried to impress people in that situation, and it's gone wrong. I mean, this happens a great deal to uh, actors, obviously, which is what inspired the thing. And I just remembered another another cringeworthy incident from my um, brief acting career thus far. I went to audition for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy film, which our friend Garth directed. I thought, you know, at the very least I can wangle myself a audition, right? Yeah. So... Um, I went along there and I was really hoping that maybe I could just get an audition to just be like a Vogon or something. Well, that's what I wanted. I just wanted a couple of lines in the flipping film. And then uh, so he said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll come in an audition for Arthur Dent, like the main part. Yes. So I said, really? Arthur Dent? OK, well, it's come in an audition for Martin Freeman's part. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. Come in an audition for the part that we've agreed with the studio is going to be played by exactly. Martin Freeman. Well, at that point, it hadn't been agreed, right. of course. And they hadn't cast Martin. They were looking at... Uh, top comedic british talent mm-hmm. to uh, fill the role but it was sort of annoying because i knew obviously i wasn't going to get that it was the main part but still i thought i'm going to give it my all you know i've got to be positive why can't i get it sure i mean i i've heard who else they're auditioning i'm better i'm better than at least none of them at you know acting so I, i'm going to give myself <laughs> a chance and and go in there uh and i thought not only that i am going to dress up like arthur dent to put myself in character. Now that's a bad idea. Yeah. What in a dressing gown <laughs> and slippers? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. ba- that's a. I don't know. I'm just instinctively. I'm feeling. Oh, I don't, it, really, is I don't really know what I'm talking about. But my gut, yeah, my yeah. guts screaming no to the, to the past. <laughs> I wish you'd been around. <laughs> I wish I'd been able to give you a little call that morning and ask you, "Hey, Joe, what do you reckon about this? I got a good idea. I'm going to dress up like Arthur Dent." For Sometimes this you hear stories yeah. where that's the thing that gets the actor the role, though. Exactly. I'm, I can't remember any specifics, but I'm sure I've read stories of great actors being overly, you know. Uh, Oh no, the story I'm thinking of is, <laughs> <laughs> is what's her face turning up to audition for Catwoman dressed as Catwoman. <laughs> Do you remember the nutty actress? Yes. I forget what she's called and she turned up... T- Sean yeah, Young. I think that was it. Yeah. She turned up dressed as in a sort of homemade Catwoman suit. <laughs> That's not going to get you the right. She didn't get the part. No. no, she didn't. Well, you know, our listeners know how this story ends because obviously Martin Freeman played the part of Arthur Dent. But uh, in I went, right, and um, I, had, I had the dressing gown in my bag, and there was a f- quite a frightening casting lady. Yeah. Quite a famous frightening casting lady as well, um, whose name I won't mention, but she was Katie in there. Casting. Uh, Janine Casting. And she was in there looking very formidable, and she's proper, you know, Hollywood casting lady. And I say just before the audition starts, actually, I... Uh, took the liberty of bringing along something to help me uh, get into character and i was already thinking like this is bad mm. this is a bad idea you could sense it but part of me was just thinking doesn't matter just ignore your instincts buckles your instincts are rubbish you should just ignore them and plow on with your brilliant idea and throw yourself into it 109 percent. and then the casting lady is really going to be knocked out by your chutzpah so i get the um i get my dressing gown out put it on <laughs> Do my audition, pretty bad. Do a pretty bad job of it. She doesn't look impressed. At the end, I'm feeling embarrassed, feeling a lot like I want to cry, and uh, and all you know, very much aware that she's been gazing at me like I'm a freakazoid. Take my dressing gown off to pack into my bag before I go out and get on my bike. 
<laughs> and uh, say, Job done. say thanks very much for seeing me. I'll put my dressing Are gown you, away there. What, what's, what have you got on under the dressing gown? Uh, just normal civvies. Normal clothes, right? Yeah. You haven't stripped down to your No, pants. I haven't stripped down to my Julius, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put my pants back on. No, we're <laughs> not using... Yes, we are. <laughs> Hang on a Sorry, second. but... You are talented. The part. <laughs> you certainly do We've have the part. You've seen your part, <laughs> and you've got the part. No, it was not. I just had civvies on. So I put I put my dressing gown away in my bag, and I say, actually said, um, probably not the uh, the done thing, I suppose, is it, to to, to dress up as No, the, it's uh, not, Adam. Part. But you've broken rules and smashed through boundaries. Yeah. And you've got the role. <laughs> that's what you wanted her to say. That's what I wanted. That's what I thought she was going to say. Yeah. Instead, she said, put it this way. If you did that kind of thing in Los Angeles, you'd never work again. <laughs> did she? Yeah. Wow. These are good stories. So, And what was the one the other... What was it the other one said? <laughs> you Why could, don't you try some acting? Yeah, you could, you could, you, you could have used acting. Wow. <laughs> And you're persevering, man. That's good. That's what it's about, man. You've got to ignore it. Yeah. Plow on. Plow on. <laughs> well, what about learning from the mistakes? Obviously, I'm learning. Yes, I'm not good. dressing up in any dressing gowns. <laughs> and I am trying to use acting in my right. auditions yes. now. Good, but... good, good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> well, listen, uh, keep your stories of auditions or job interviews as well, because um, obviously it would be a little bit limiting if we were just asking for acting auditions. But, you know... Uh, a job interview is where you're put on the spot, expected to perform, and something uh, critical is at stake. The what's the text number six four zero four six? Yeah, or adamandjoe.six music at bbc.co.uk, and we'll read out some of your uh, missives in a bit. We're going to play some Depeche Mode. After that, we've got a new ten o'clock top of hour jingle coming up. That's wow. exciting. But here's the mode right now with wrong, wonderful stuff. That's Supergrass with Grace. This that's is Adam and Joe. Stuff. That's not... I mean, that would be wonderful as well. Yeah. but That's the uh, most wonderful of all stuff. Surely. Of course. That's golden stuff there. Yeah. Well, no, that would then be golden stuff. Oh, for goodness sake. That was uh, Supergrass. I said all that already, didn't I? Sound <laughs> I mean, I, I... You sound really beaten down, man. It's all right. I know. I didn't mean to. That's all right. Listen, let's... let's... do a more energetic one. Let's pretend that the, the single's just ended. <laughs> That was Grace by Supergrass. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Get down! Joe! It's just aggressive. It's like That was too aggressive, of, uh, wasn't it? Yeah, it's like the man from Full Metal Jacket doing Oh, no, I'm doing sorry. DJ. I went too far. I went too far the yeah. other way. That was Grace by oh, Supergrass. No. <laughs> and you're listening to the smooth sounds of Adam and Joe on a Saturday morning. Now you're just getting Ooh. ladies excited. <laughs> that's inappropriate on a Saturday morning. Be like Howard Stern. Press yourself against your DAB. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, listen, it's time for some of your texts in Text the Nation. Can we bear the jingle again, or have we overplayed the jingle? No, nah, a no, shorter one. Text the Nation. Text, text, text. Text the Nation. What if I don't want to? Text the Nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. Someone sent in this week just a completely straight cover of that jingle. Did you hear yeah, that? Yeah, I like that. That's good. <laughs> I like that a lot. We might play that later. That's a good direction for listener-made yeah. jingles to go in. Can you um, replicate the jingles we already use so precisely that we can't tell? <laughs> what if they just sent in the jingle again? Someone did that as well, though, didn't they? Pretty much, yeah. They just sent in one of our own jingles. <laughs> <laughs> but we should... Is that loaded at all? It isn't. No, maybe maybe that might have to be next week. No, we, we can find it. We can find it. We'll, we'll try and load it before the end okay, of the show. Okay, so anyway, these are your uh, some responses to Text the Nation, which is all about interviews or auditions and awful experiences you've had therein. This is from Simon in Wimbledon. I had an interview for an engineering firm last year. Partway through, my phone rang, but luckily it was on silent and only vibrating. I tried shifting my leg to move the phone deeper into my pocket to reduce the sound of the buzzing, but in doing so, answered the phone. <laughs> it was my mother. And I also put it on speakerphone accidentally. What a loony. All, so, all with my dexterous right thigh. Hello. <laughs> Simon, are you there? It's mummy, said the voice. <laughs> Needless to say, the rejection letter I received three days later was very polite. Well, you don't want to work for a firm that's going to reject you on the basis of a mummy call. I know. You would be hired instantly by the Adam and Joe Corp. Absolutely. Just for still using the word mummy, you'd be right in there. Yeah, you'd be made MD. <laughs> in fact, that's one of our application criteria. Exactly. Do you call your parents mum and dad or mummy and daddy? And they'll get all confused and they'll think, oh, I don't know. What's the right answer? Uh, mum and dad probably is the coolest thing. To uh, mum and dad, thank you very get much out. for coming in. Get out! 
Here's another one from <laughs> Mariel. She says, at the end of an interview, which I thought had gone well, the interviewer got up to say goodbye. He stood uncomfortably close to me. So I thought, oh, he's going to kiss me. <laughs> what? OK, just go with it. Don't be uptight. It's all very media. <laughs> so I kissed him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Only to look down to see his outstretched hand <laughs> waiting to shake mine. So I kissed that it too. It still makes me cringe three years on. Well done, Mary. I, again, you would have got the, the job at uh, Big British Castle instantly. <laughs> yeah, you would we would have got more than you bargained for, probably. <laughs> <Any physical laughs> at that very contact. interview. Hello. Hey, you're our kind of girl. <clears throat> now, you're not the kind of person who causes trouble, are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's our rigorous interview procedure. Uh, here's one from an anonymous texter. I'm a casting director and have had many difficult audition times. One particularly awkward audition, I recall, was when I was working with a very well-known director who asked an actor the typical question, so what have you done recently? To which the, the actor replied, no, you first. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, he didn't get the job. That's great. <laughs> You might as well, if you kind of sense you're not going to get the job, yeah. you might as well. Uh, no, but no, because then you get a reputation. Well the future, because the reason these casting directors are so uh, eccentric and difficult is cause, is there are not many of them, and they're enormously powerful. Sure, right? There's 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 four or five really famous casting directors in London mm. who American studios hire to see actors, and they're they're, they're megalomaniacs. Yeah. I mean, I'm never going to get an acting job now that I've said that. <laughs> They've got maybe a distorted sense of power, possibly. Yeah. I'm sure some of them are very nice and lovely. Some of them are lovely. They They're are. Brilliant. They're well, brilliant people. Well, the guy I had yesterday was amazing. He was amazing. <laughs> he was nice. Well, yeah. But no, sometimes they're, they're brutal. I mean, they you hear all sorts of stories. There was a there's an actor friend I had the other day who was... Uh, I, that came out wrong. There's an actor friend <laughs> I know. I didn't have them. Um, and they were telling a story about doing an audition where the casting director was just flicking through like a copy of Heat. Really? Yeah. And shouldn't be allowed. That's a cattle call. You know, that's no good. Here's another one from Kate, who says, An interviewer asked me, When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I truthfully answered, A fairy. <laughs> <laughs> she looked appalled, so I hastily corrected, Well, queen of the fairies. <laughs> she looked so shocked that I started giggling and couldn't stop. I didn't get the job. An executive fairy. <laughs> In charge of a large department of uh, uh, an, a elves. fairy task force. Here's one from Tamsin. Aggregating I fairy power. I had a fit of giggles in my first job interview many years ago when the interviewer asked me if I saw myself having a, quote, big job <laughs> in the future. <laughs> oh, dear. Lindsay uh, Norwich, who supplies her age, 31. When I was 18, I went to an interview for the role of campsite person. Uh, I was asked what my worst characteristic was, to which I replied, uh, sometimes I get a bit angry. <laughs> I've never worked on a campsite. <laughs> <laughs> These are very good. It's the understatement that really sells it, isn't it? <laughs> Please keep those coming in. The text number is 64046. Uh, you can email us at adam and joe.6music at bbc.co.uk. And don't forget, of course, if you're listening to this show during the week on Listen Again or uh, on the podcast, you can still keep your text the nation suggestions coming i was grinding to a halt there <laughs> no, some of the on. cogs just popped out Push of my on. brain and i was scrabbling around trying to refit them i've been operating without <laughs> cogs for months Have you? yeah there's nothing in there wow. it's just a sort well, of i jelly, got excited because last machine. night i found one of them right Did you? yeah down the back of the sofa while i was watching lost I, wish and I had a cog i popped it back in and then it just popped out there so i was, I was saying we got retro text the nation so if you're listening during the week you can still suggest your audition stroke job interview nightmare stories right now here's jack pinate with tonight's today today to, tonight tonight's today today we play this every, every week don't we, we without got, fail we got some special jack pinate we played it the last three weeks it's good though isn't it it's very good i love to hear it but and um, let, let's hear it again <laughs> <laughs> very nice very exciting this is adam and joe here on bbc six music we got a letter this week or a email from andrew woods the woodman he says, Dear Adam and Joe, re-total wipeout. Hey, Joe Cornish, he says. Cornish is in capitals. You ungrateful little idiot hole. You are blessed with celebrity and all the opportunity that comes with it. And you've become so spoiled 
that you would spurn the opportunity to go on the hilarious Total Wipeout television program. This is outrageous! <laughs> and it is makes this letter me from who? furious! Is this letter from Adam Buxton? No, it's from Andy Woods. He's part of uh, Stupid Squad. Uh, Gah! He says in the middle. I'm, I'm just doing shouting yes, for, doing the, a good job, man. for the capitals. He says, we the people have to audition for the opportunity to humiliate ourselves on, the te on television. And you turn it down? I don't believe it! He says, all, also shouting. Um, As you may have guessed, I have, with my friend John, recently auditioned for Total Wipeout. And neither of us have yet been selected. That's his dream <laughs> to go on that programme. And they invited you. read that you. last bit with a genuine sense of de dejection yeah. and flatness. You know what? I watched that show last weekend when mm. I got home. It's I'd a never good seen show. it before. Is it? <laughs> yes, it is a good show. <laughs> yeah, I like it. What's I like the, the deal way, with um... the giant balls? Because most of the course, right? If you haven't seen this yeah. show, it's hosted by Hammond the Hammond <laughs> oh, no. uh, Hamster. Hosted in the loosest possible sense. I mean, he's obviously done a day in front of a blue screen, yeah. hasn't he? And got paid a million cars for it. Come on. Or whatever they pay him in. Hamsters actually eat grain. <laughs> so he's probably been paid in an enormous quantity of grain. They've just given him a little <laughs> bottle of water to sip at. <laughs> Yeah, he, there is a wheel just just out of uh, frame. <laughs> um, but yeah, wow. it's it's like an obstacle. It's it's a bit like it's a knockout. It's a it's a big impossible obstacle course, and they it's dress like them up. She's castle, right? And they dress them up in sort of uh, big padded protective gear, and they have to n negotiate well, their way the around. That was the thing I was course. thinking. That's one of the things that makes it less fun because if it was the seventies, mm. they could, you know, they could do it without a safety health vest and safety thing, and right. a helmet. Mm -hmm. There's so much safety gear now that it slightly takes. It must make it very heavy for you when I you think fall in the water. That's part of the thing is that physically it makes it almost impossible to negotiate any yeah, of these you must obstacles. Be exhausted just by dragging your stupid helmet. And yeah. Life jacket around. Anyway, so he's angry there. He's absolutely furious. But I was thinking, like, how, you know, the balls, but there's one bit where you have to leap, because you were boasting last week how good you would be at the balls. Well, I wasn't, but I was being silly, but I, when you see people do those balls, you can tell what they're not doing. <laughs> the more you see, I can't really talk like this, then not go on, can I? Yeah. There's it's... four enormous, bouncy, inflatable balls, right? And the and the thing you have to do is bounce, in theory, I'm on so top tall. of each ball and then get to the other Can side. Can you imagine? I could probably just lie across all the balls right. I'm so tall. But all that happens... And create a bridge. All the other contestants could, could run across me. <laughs> and then we'd all win. And then we could beat up the Hammond and bring the programme down like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Running Man. You can't say all that and then not go on now. <laughs> well, now I can't go on because they know I'm going to bring the show down. Right. Don't get John, he's trouble. <laughs> exactly. But the idea that you could negotiate the balls, I don't believe it. There's no, no one can do that. No one got past the first ball on the show oh, no. I watched. A couple of guys do it. No. Yeah, a, guys have done it. And it's kind of fluky, you know, when they show it in slow-mo, you can see that it that they're very lucky they just happen to have fallen in the right place. Or, bounced right. Yeah, it, it's, people can do the first two, right. but it's very hard to know quite what momentum, what velocity, what direction you'll be going by the third one. They're very unpredictable balls. They certainly are. <laughs> That's what made me think of you. <laughs> well, it's a match made in heaven, isn't it? That's what this. That's what. That's a way that you could describe this show as well, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> right, I've got a free play coming up right now. This is the uh, pretty things. You know what? I'm relieved. We're moving on. I'm kind. Of, I feel off the hook. Yeah. I thought you were going to like do more targeted bullying. No, I wasn't not bullying. Going on. I wasn't, but I, I would, after watching the pro show, I would just like to see how you dealt with Can you with imagine the, my the balls. enormous thin stick-like frame spinning in the air? Yes, I can. Like the stick from 2001. Yes, very much <laughs> so. bounced off a huge... Sploshing into the water with your head <laughs> bashing on one of the poles on your way down. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. A bit of gore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh dear, no, that was a very nasty fall. Yeah. Oh, he's... I, 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 and Joe's had to retire from celebrity <laughs> uh, total wipeout because he's broken his arm in five places. I'm going to be sat at home going, hey, hey, hey. this is entertainment. To say. I'm joking. Joking, obviously, I'd are be you upset. Though? Are you? I am joking. Of course, yeah. well, I don't want to Where see you. Where do jokes come from? I wouldn't want to see your arm broken in five <laughs> places. <laughs> so listen, free play time. This is from the album F uh, SF Sorrow by The Pretty Things. Uh, it's a kind of landmark in psychedelic rock from 1968, the LP. I strongly recommend it if you're not familiar with it. And this is a track called Balloon Burning. Who was that then? That was The Pretty Things with uh, Balloon Burning from the album SF Sorrow. 
That's very, very nice. That's crazy psychedelic stuff from the end of the 60s, man. Things were happening then, you know? There was a revolution going on. In the head! Wow. I was watching uh, Moonraker the other week. Good choice. Yeah, they're they're releasing all the Bond films on Blu-ray. How's that standing up? It looked amazing. Did it? I love Moonraker. That was that was absolutely our prime yeah, bang age, on. wasn't it? Yeah. There's a scene where James Bond he's looking for a doctor called Doctor Goodhead. Yes, I remember. He Dr. goes Goodhead. into uh, uh, a it's room, pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> and he says, "I'm looking for Doctor Goodhead." And a beautiful woman turns around and says, "I'm Doctor Goodhead." He goes, "A woman." <laughs> <laughs> now, th- <laughs> now that's big screen entertainment. <laughs> they keep trying to kill him in it, right? So they keep trying to kill James that's Bond. That's amazing, isn't it? That yeah, is ju- that's woman. like <laughs> less than 30 years ago. I mean, it's brilliant, but it's turned into like the most incredible high budget episode of Garth Marenghi's Dark, Dark Place mm. or something when you watch it now. Was it 82, 83? Late right? 70s, I think, because it was cashing in on Star Wars, wasn't it? I think it was just at the beginning of the 80s, Moonraker. I think it was 70, 79. Yeah, but I think. Because <laughs> I think it came out around the same time maybe, as Poltergeist. Maybe 1980. 1980. Uh, no, Poltergeist was 82. Right. So yeah. I think it was, it, it was late. In the UK. Yeah. Well, we'll some, someone will tell us. Someone, someone will look it up. Someone will find but um, they try to kill James Bond a lot in it, right? Don't yeah, they? They're yeah. all Drax, played by Michael Lonsdale. Very good performance. Very grounded and serious. Yeah, it is. No, like, it is. It's a good performance. No, I'm doing an impression of yeah. him. Yeah. He is like a very, very, very evil man. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like Jonathan Ross doing his, uh, <laughs> his German accent. But um, Drax is trying to kill Bond, and I don't know, but he, he, he goes about it in a very roundabout way. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, James Bond is in Venice to investigate some things, and he's coming home from an investigation on a gondola. Yeah. So Drax decides it would be a good idea. Did we talk about this before? To fake up a funeral cortege. And have a knife thrower uh, in a in a coffin, mm-hmm. and then wh- while James Bond goes past, the knife thrower pops out and th- tries to throw knives at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to get rid of him. Now, what kind of a universe would that be? A logical thought. You know, the best way to get rid of someone I find is to is to arrange an elaborate cortege. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only logical way that that would be a sensible decision would be. And in a way, it does make some sense, because since the very beginnings of the Bond films, they've tried to just do normal things like shoot him and hit him. Mm. And it hasn't worked through all the early films. So the villains who probably communicate about this kind of thing have reached a mutual understanding that Bond can't be killed. I mean, some people still just try and kick him and fight him. Sure. It never works. So they have to think of more and more elaborate ruses. What if we tied uh, some little bombs to uh, um, uh, balloons and then we got we somehow lured bond into a fair and made him want to buy a little bomb balloon exactly exactly <laughs> like how would you kill if james bond was going to see monsters versus aliens in right. 3d at the imax this ah, weekend brilliant how would you kill him at that we shall put <laughs> acid on the side of his 3d glasses so that the arms of the glasses eat into his brain that what what about having a giant 3d spike that comes out of the screen <laughs> but it's a real spike. spike the thing is that's how i'd go about that that's good man you know everywhere james bond goes people try and kill him but he's always like for instance with the knife throwing thing in venice uh what haven't they planned for that he's got a hover gondola ah. and of course they didn't think you know they didn't think well he's Damn he's it. got a hover gollander got gollander gollander yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then at another stage, they try and kill him. You know, he's uh, being shown round Drax's facility mm. and they put him in a, a machine that simulates G- G-Force. Right, right, right. And they decide to make the machine make go it at go faster. speeds. No, faster. Faster. And what, didn't they, what don't they factor in there? That he's got a watch that fires a spike that presses the off button. The kill switch. The, kill the chicken switch, switch right. Mm. Oh, damn it. <sighs> Bond has got us again. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it's a shame they've gone back to basics with those films. Because now it's straightforward killing. Well, they've isn't gone it? back to the beginning and they're back to trying to punch and shoot punch him, and or kicking. maybe. And they, you know, they should know that that doesn't work. You've got to think much more elaborately yeah. to try and kill him. We shall seed the clouds with tiny little knives. 
And he's then got a metal umbrella. Make a uh, damn. It, it just happened that when Q gave him the equipment, there just happened to be a metal umbrella. Very well. <laughs> um, we shall tempt him to the park and get laser ducks. <laughs> laser ducks. Laser ducks. That's a good and idea. when he goes to feed them, yeah, but he's got mirrored bread. Damn it! <laughs> and it, the lasers ricochet off the bread. Damn! Blow it. up the ducks. Once again, he has foiled us. We shall keep thinking. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you see, in a way, those uh, Roger Moore Bond films are more realistic than the new ones. That's true, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because that's a more realistic approach to certainly to more kill James Bond. romantic. Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. It is just gone ten thirty. It's time for the news. That's Farrell Williams. You say Farrell or Farrell? Farrell, I think. Farrell. He's front yeah. fronting. Mm. Is that new Farrell? Pharrell? No, that's old. Old Pharrell. Pharrell. Sorry, I'm, I'm not getting the Pharrell memo. <laughs> this is Adam and Joe on BBC Six Music uh, on this uh, rather grimy Saturday morning here in London. As we speak, it is a little bit on the grimy side, and they're saying that the warm spat is a thing of the past. Warm spat? Is that the correct terminology? Yeah, if you heat up your spats. Mm, exactly. These spats are very warm. Um, but, you know, it seemed as if summer was arriving. And, it did, didn't it? And they're saying now... It's not. Oh, dear. It isn't. But listen, you know, a few weeks ago, we had a text the nation about made up jokes, jokes you've made up. Mm. And uh, we're happy to say that listeners have kept sending them in. People maybe who are a bit behind on their podcasts, who've only just heard that, uh, contribute via email. And that's highly acceptable. We enjoy that kind of thing. So we thought we might um, tell, tell you some of the good jokes we've received. And you've got to remember, these are, these are made up by people. That's the criteria. Yeah. That you've got to have authored these jokes yourself. Yeah. Um, so, and we've even done a little jingle jungle, or I've done a jingle jungle. See what you think. This might be the first and last time this ever gets played. It's a tricky balancing act when you do a jingle about jokes, right? But I've gone in this direction. <laughs> I'm a funny person, I often make up jokes My jokes are more amusing than those of other folks When you hear my joke I think you'll find that you agree Come on, you're all invited to a made-up joke party <laughs> well, Not another party, <laughs> we've already got the Nectar Points party It's all about the party <laughs> It's going to be quite an extraordinary on. party It's up to us That was to very make... good, that was very good And it, it cleverly captured the sort of sense of resignation and slight depression what? That, that maybe lingers behind some of these jokes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a darkness had some, It had some comedy sound effects though <laughs> It did, they were very funny, there's nothing funnier than a, than a like, honky horn Honky horn <laughs> Honky the or horn a dong. Here's a joke I picked out, this was um, written by uh, Callum's friend Mark Fraser Hey He made the joke up when he was around primary five, that's age nine or ten Knock knock Who's there? I done up I done up what? No, <laughs> Adam Buxton. <laughs> what kind of a man are you? I'm an idiot. You are an idiot, Hull. <laughs> I, I done up what? Well, I think the rest of the listeners could understand where that was supposed to go. God, <laughs> did you do that on purpose? No, I didn't. Do you, do you know about about knock knock jokes? Yeah, but if you do something up, it's generally you're not doing a person up, right? You're doing a thing yeah. up, so I'm asking you, what did Come you on. do up? I'm just T being logical about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't deliberately <laughs> that torpedo that one. <laughs> uh, here's one. This is from James Tricky in Brighton. He says that, I've heard Pixar are doing a remake of the Star Trek film, The Search for Spock. They're going to call it Finding Nimoy. Hey! <laughs> Hey, you over there. <laughs> hey, come you, on. The steady crew. Come on. <laughs> well, that's a joke for Star Trek fans. What? That's a joke for everybody. Finding Nimoy. No, that's good. That's funny. That's funny. That's funny. All right, <laughs> we're going to support these jokes now. I'm going to do you another one. You're going to support right. this. You're going right. to laugh. Yeah, I'm going to laugh. Have you seen that Jamie Oliver? This isn't the joke, but have you seen that Jamie Oliver Sainsbury's ad where they're selling, um, he's doing, he's at some kind of outdoor picnic? And he's selling cakes. I haven't seen this one. It's good. And he's giving people buns. And a woman who he gives a bun to goes, Oh, Jamie, nice buns. And it has a shot of his bottom. 
and he turns around and goes, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and then there's a pause in the laugh, and then he laughs more as if he's found a hidden nuance to the joke. Nice buns. <laughs> <laughs> and it ends watch out for it it's a really strained laugh we were talking about fake laughs before <laughs> forcing yourself to laugh at a joke and yeah that jamie oliver laugh man. well i've got a, a, another jingle for for the jokes later on with Have a strange you? laugh on the top of it might play it later here's another joke then oh here we go hang on do you want to hear one in, in yeah, the time on. oh no here we go here we go this is from uh phil suffield uh, here's an original joke made up my, by my girlfriend Susan that you might enjoy. One time we were just settling down to eat dinner, tuna steaks and rice with veggies, when a pea rolled off my plate and onto the floor. It happens a lot. I can't believe you're reading this one. <laughs> I like this one. I looked at her, she looked at me, she said, it's an escapee. <laughs> That's funny, because that happens all the time in households, and people can use that all the time when a pee goes off. You go, "That's an escapee." <laughs> <laughs> that is funny, but you see, you put too much pressure on it. If like, I'm sure at home, like between a couple, that's the kind of thing that keeps a marriage right. alive. Yeah, oh, that's funny. I hadn't thought of that before. No, that is funny. It made me chuckle when I read it. Uh, all right, how about this one? Didn't make you chuckle when I read it. No, it did. It made me <laughs> chuckle that you were reading it. <laughs> well, that's different, isn't it? <laughs> how about this from Jeff in Dublin? Mm. I hear there's a new HBO gritty US drama set in Baltimore about a radio station. <laughs> no, the- this one. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the problem is that we've both read all the emails. <laughs> so I know what these are going to be before <laughs> you read it. <laughs> Come on then. <laughs> <laughs> we need to record that Jamie Oliver laugh and use it as a right. jingle. Yeah, okay. I hear there's a new HBO gritty US drama set in Baltimore about a radio station where the characters turn out to be not what you expect. It's called The Wireless. Yeah, here's another one. Um, <laughs> this like is, that one yeah, too. that's quite good. Let's go one for wire fans. Yeah, and radio fans. Mm. <laughs> Come on then. No, I can't. <laughs> I can't read it out. Well, you know what? We got an email from Will Sargent, who's the guitar player in Echo and the Bunny Man. Oh, yeah. And that is pretty much enough for me. You know what I mean? That, that was very exciting for me. Uh, he listens to the show, which is extraordinary. And he says that uh, he and the band have been making up jokes for years on tour of a similar kind and uh, he says they usually end with a famous name here's a few examples he sent a very long list didn't he quite a long list most of which i can't read out because they're too dirty uh for example he's got very small feet who's that then dave clark's five now i didn't quite understand that well there's a band called the dave clark five yes, right and clark's shoes yeah and size five size would be five. very small dave dave clark's five yeah yeah <laughs> the apostrophe s is in the wrong place <laughs> i can't read any of the other ones out because they're too rude but i'm going to see if i can get away with this one he's got constipation you know who william shatner you know um when you're in a band you spend <laughs> a lot of time on a bus he says it works best if you shake your head and look disappointed for the yeah. nah bit shatner. of shatner yeah shatner <laughs> <laughs> well they gave me a chuckle thanks very much indeed will uh, have you got any more there? Yeah, yeah, I do, but I'm not going to read them out. Oh, really? Yeah, the current climate. Oh, come isn't on! Isn't suitable. No, I, t- I've suddenly thought twice. What about the What about the the monkeys one? Did you like that? And what was that one? I think maybe I've heard. Th- I don't know if this guy made these up, but they made me chuckle. Uh, he says, "This is from Chris." He says, "I just finished listening to the podcast. If you fancy doing some more made up jokes." Uh, then here's a few that my mate Darren Ward made up that never failed to make me smile. I'm not sure if Darren Ward did make these up, but they're quite good. Why did the monkey fall out of the tree? Because it was dead. Why did the second monkey fall out of the tree? Because he was holding on to the first monkey. Why did the third monkey fall out of the tree? He thought it was a game. <laughs> the look of satisfaction on your face is funnier than the joke. <laughs> I was thinking about like um children listening to it and I thought if I was a child I would think that was funny. Yeah, it's it's just like random non sequiturs, right? Is that what's happening there? No. 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 I shouldn't think about it, should this, I? That's wrong. No, it's way too sophisticated it's for too someone sophi- like I you. I don't understand it. Anyway, thanks very much for those jokes. Maybe they weren't the best jokes. 
but they were good nevertheless. Well, they're authored, so, you exactly. know, they're authored by the listeners, so they have a, a, a sort of homemade charm. Hey, we're going to play this insane Super Furry Animals track Yeah, right this now. is this from their new album? Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, this is Inaugural Trams. It seems to be a song about uh, integrated public transport. Um, and it is, it's, I mean, it's, you've got to love a world where something this nutty is on the radio. This is Super Furry Animals. Matt for Lush is live in the hub. Wow. We should hang around and be creepy with her. Do you think? Yeah. Be inappropriately flirty. She would love it. She'd love that. <laughs> She'd love but a couple nothing of... Nothing a beautiful young woman likes more than, than a weird... Lardy, creepy man. <laughs> 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 Looking at her <laughs> longingly and making slightly dirty... It's a lovely <laughs> Natasha Khan. Hello. Ooh. You've got lovely knees. <laughs> knees. Ooh. They're different from mine. Let's compare them. Uh, look at your glitter around your eyes. Oh, that's... There's something else then. I got quite freaked out. <laughs> 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 All right, let's do some text the nations. Let's play a text the nation jingle. Text the nation. Text, text, text. Text the nation. What if I don't want to? Text the nation. It doesn't matter. Text. Oh dear, it's having a little bit of a giggle. Uh, text the nation this um, week, listeners, is all about auditions or job interviews. When you've been put on the spot, you have to perform, sell yourself, do your thing, and it's all gone horribly wrong. We were inspired by some disastrous audition stories from Adam there. From my audition locker. <clears throat> yep. Um, those days are behind me. I'm going to nail pretty much every audition I get from yeah, now on. Yeah, you should be in one of those Judd Apatow films. I should do, should You know, I? if Russell Brand can be in, uh, you know, um, what's his name, Adam Sandler's films? Yes. Well, well he's I, better looking, though. That's the problem. Yeah, but still, when I watch, I haven't seen that film, but when I watch the trailer, I, if it feels like a bit of a, an imposition. Yeah. It's like, what, what are you doing in that? That's true, isn't it? Getting above his station. But then how would people feel if I popped up? They'd feel even more annoyed. Well, they'd known you to, <clears throat> you, to, you know, work to get there. That's true. I've, you know, I've put, I've paid my dues, and I've also got a huge amount. But it would be hard of... to suspend disbelief. You reckon? Just, oh, that's Doctor Buckles. <laughs> no, go, but that's what's for listeners he doing, this pretending program? to be a whatever you're pretending to be. Yeah. Do you think? Well, that's a major problem, then, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. a major impediment to my acting no, You're right career. for Americans, which is a much bigger um, yes, exactly. audience. They wouldn't know who you were. You'd be mysterious and be. Who's that amazing guy? Yeah. He's brilliant. Wow, if only he did some kind of radio show on a digital <laughs> if, station. If that only would he be knew brilliant. how to act. <laughs> Come on, read <laughs> Sorry, some things. Sorry, you said that, not me. Um, okay, here is one from an anonymous texter. My friend Paul went to a job interview and on his way he walked into the overhanging branch of a tree. He brushed his head off and carried on to the interview. At first, everything was going well in the interview. He was answering the questions and felt he had a rapport with the lady. But then something appeared in front of his eyes. It was a baby spider that had just hatched in his hair. <laughs> he carried on answering questions while trying to coolly brush the spider away with his hand, praying that the interview hadn't seen it. As the interview continued, more and more spiders hatched in his hair what? and abseiled down the front of his face. He managed somehow to get through the interview, but couldn't tell from her expression if she had noticed. As they were so tiny, it was possible she hadn't seen them and had just thought he had a nervous habit of running his hand through his hair. He stood up to shake her, sa her hand and decided to say, Sorry to be the bringer of the spiders. He never <laughs> heard back from the company. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Of course, the other thing is that he was just imagining them. He'd yes. eaten something weird, you know? Maybe. And he was going into a special place in his mind. Sorry to be the bringer of the spiders. Sorry to be the bringer of the spiders. That's something some Thanks sort of... Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of thing an agent of Satan might say. Yeah, exactly. If he was preparing for the apocalypse. Well, keep your CV on file, and if anything <laughs> comes up, we'll give you a call. <laughs> Sorry to be the bringer of the spiders. <laughs> <laughs> I like the spider guy. He had a say yeah. something. <laughs> could I can see the moon in your face. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Here's one from David Carrot. Good morning, chaps. Uh, I once applied to study geography at Oxford University. On my application form, I had described a passion for current affairs. In the interview, the tutor produced a map, pointed to a country, asked me to identify it. Baffled, I responded, um, China. It was Iraq. <laughs> he looked furious. I received a polite rejection letter on Christmas Eve. Fun times. <laughs> David Carrot. <laughs> Here's one from Colette. 
<laughs> I went for a job interview with Her Majesty's China. <laughs> China's a big one, isn't that's it? A, I mean, that's an easy one. Yeah, it's quite conspicuous. <laughs> <laughs> I went for a job with Her Majesty's Customs a few years ago. At the end of the interview, I was asked why I thought I'd be good at the job. I went completely blank and replied, uh, do you know, really, just think I would be. Like looking through people's bags. <laughs> Colette doesn't tell us whether she got it. Probably did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would say they would be very impressed with that. Matt Garrill in London. I did an advert casting for a popular high street bank not so very long ago. I had to simulate being on a water slide going through San Paolo. Whoa. You've seen that advert, haven't yes, you? Yes, I have, yeah. Yeah, so have I. Unfortunately, the powers of my acting alone were insufficient. And what they really wanted me to do to get a true representation of what it looked like would be to strip down to my pants and be pushed around the room on a swivelly office chair by the director. Just pieces of meat. Just pieces of meat is all they are. That's Actors. weird. That's going very far. I guess you, you'd need to see how they looked in the undies. That's the thing. That I mean, you know, half the time you're, you've got in your head all these ideas about delivering a wonderful performance and communicating something special with your acting skills. All they want half the time, mo more than half the time, is just the look, isn't Someone it? Someone the right height and stuff. Exactly. Yeah, who looks right. Here's what, uh, finally, here's one from uh, A. Sandham. Dear Adam and Joe, after completing a particularly long and harrowing interview that kept wandering off track, the relief at reaching the end was such that I stood up and blurted out, oh, that was weird, wasn't it? <laughs> there was a long moment. They quickly ushered me out. I never heard from them again. <laughs> oh, he you almost see, made it. all these people on the spot. Yeah. Don't you think? You can come and work for us at the castle. I don't say that. No, I mean, you can't. <laughs> There's no question what you meant to say. That's right. <laughs> There's no way that you're going to come Now, what's this record? Near the Delphic with Counterpoint. Uh, yeah, Sounds never heard this before. Is this a new edition to the playlist, Ben? No. Let's just play it. We'll check our note. Oh, oh, my God. I've got it wrong. I'm so sorry. It's not Delphic with Counterpoint. Oh, it's That's your free play. Up. It's my free play. This is uh, Corner Shop with Top Knot. That's Camera Obscura with a track about the French Navy. I love camera obscuras. Is a camera obscura one of those dark rooms you go into and there's a big white table and the outside world is projected via some kind of natural light refraction yeah. phenomena onto it's like that a, table? It's like a giant pinhole camera. There's isn't one it? in Greenwich. Yeah. It's awesome. And there's one in Bristol as well. Yeah, that's it? right, near the suspension bridge. Yeah, they're lovely. They're very, it's a very strange experience to yeah. go into one of them, isn't it? They're wicked and it's so terrific they've got together and formed a band now, all the camera obscuras. That's right. I thought they were buildings. Who who knew? Who knew they could actually they play could, guitar and tour? Yeah, and moreover, that they were so interested in the French Navy. Yes. That they would write a song about the it. The world's a wonderful phantasmagoria. It is. And absolutely. Do you like people who pronounce that word phantasmagoria? No, but I do love uh, Mr. Majorium's Phantasmagorium. Wonder Emporium. Wonder Emporium. Yeah, that's one of my favourite shops. It's under threat, actually, of closure and... Um, it's going to be rebranded. <clears throat> as, is it? Yeah, as Johnny Magic's House of Tragic. Really? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Strange thing to say. <laughs> I thought I was riffing there. Yeah. Like, you know, like Zavi. Right, yeah. No, that's Re good. No, it's good. Credit yeah. crunch. I think what I'll do is I'll listen to it again. On the podcast. On the podcast. And, I'll and then get a little chuckle. Yeah, exactly. Hey, speaking of which, you know, I, um, by the time the podcast for this show comes out... You will be able to download or just have a look at on my YouTube site, which we'll link to on the BBC's website, mm. a video of me enjoying the podcast in my shed. Excellent. Because we talked about that on the podcast. Yeah, how long is it? A week or so back. How long do you think I should make it? I haven't shot it yet. I think you should make it the entire duration of the podcast. <laughs> and I think you should put the podcast audio over it. So right. for one week only, listeners can enjoy <laughs> the whole podcast accompanied by a night vision video of you in a shed wearing what? Wearing like a, a, a sort of um, Japanese nightgown. Wearing a Japanese nightgown, uh, conducting with one hand, sipping wine with the other and laughing at yourself. Well, I won't be able to put the audio from the podcast, this week's podcast, on it yet because it hasn't been done. Right. So it'll have to be last week's podcast. That's true. Unless they send you the podcast, you know. Like an uh, advanced copy. Yeah, because it needs to be, it's finished, then it, someone listens, checks it for compliance. But you can send me one bit of the podcast, Ben, and then I'll do a video of myself listening to that and appreciating it. I'll send you this bit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow that'll, be, that'll be some kind of implosion. Like it'll be like the Hadron Collider. Charlie Kaufman world. <laughs> well, that's something to look forward to. Okay.
Uh, now, I think it's been a while since we had any Stephen news on the program. It is, some Stevenage. Well, we've got kind of a jingle here uh, by way of an introduction to some Stephen news. Yeah, Stephen! Cool. Wow. That's the audience of a Radio 4... Is it Radio 4? No, it's Radio 2 pilot that I did the other day. A new film quiz with John Holmes that he's devised. And the audience there for that recording were kind enough to indulge a little bit of Stevenage. So let me tell you that we've had a message here, just a a very brief explanation if you don't know what Steven is all about. It's a way for people who listen to this show to communicate with strangers and find out if they are also listeners to the show. All you have to do is stand in a public place and go, Stephen! And if anyone says, just coming, that means that they probably listen to this programme. So, we got a message here phil joe phil joe Phil Joe. uh yeah it's an email we got from a listener who i encountered in the street oh yes here we go and it, i've got a bad yeah i've got a record of bad responses to um well you you leave Stephen. a lot of people hanging i do rob farris is the guy's name dear adam yes that's right adam note i am not talking to joe i've just been party to a crime against stevening I exited my building for lunch on Monday the 30th of March at approximately 1.30pm and who should I see meandering gently along the pavement towards me but Mr Joe Cornish. My goodness, I thought, what an opportunity, a chance for a real life Stephen. I paused and checked again that it was definitely him in front of me, then raised a hand and proclaimed, Stephen! He caught my eye and with the slightest smile replied, hey, without breaking step. It was more of a hey. Hey. Without breaking step, hands firmly planted in his big, smug, comfy jacket. (laughs) Hey! He's angry at my jacket. He's absolutely furious. Hey, he says. Hey, what sort of response is that? I feel not only as a podcaster and a regular listener, but more importantly, a license payer, that I am owed a just coming by Joe. I've provided my contact details below and look forward to receiving the appropriate response. Yours, left hanging, Rob Farris. So you, you have an opportunity now to uh, deal with the situation. Oh, no, well, well, I'll call him up during the next record on his mobile and, uh, and do a Just Coming. Really? Yeah. Mm. But I don't want to set any precedent. I mean, I, I thought this was a thing that listeners did right. amongst themselves. I thought we didn't have to... We're exempt. I thought we were exempt. Because it's obvious we know about the show because we're on it. I was doing a thing. I was probably thinking about things. Sure. I'd finished a thing and I was mulling it over thinking in my head. Thinking of new dialogue. Yeah, some amazing <laughs> thing. <laughs> and I just, you know, I feel you, Adam Buxton, you're better at this than me, but but you have more of a live presence in the world. You do live gigs and stuff. Yeah. You you meet our audience at the coalface. I'm more hermit-like. Right. And socially awkward. Are you? And yeah. <laughs> so i'm not as good you know i don't really perform much come um, on you denied the man a just coming i did but you're gonna fix it though, i'm right? gonna fix it yeah but but you know in future i mean i don't want to just go around in the world in a state of mortal terror <laughs> I mean, it's starting to happen i uh, that comedy gig i went to it's hardly mortal terror it's just people it is but, for me it's basically people just sort of saying hello and all you have to do is say hello back but in yeah, a but different language no, you have to go just come here <laughs> <laughs> and it just doesn't come as naturally as as hello hey how are you doing i mean another yeah. thing we could establish is that if uh, a listener sees one of us in the street they could go hello right and i could say like this could be the thing it could be a thing and i'd say hi ah okay yeah yeah how about that yeah, I like it. Yeah. Well, here's another chap who thinks that maybe the whole Stephen thing is burning out anyway. Mm. Dave in Cambridge. He says, I write this with my ears still ringing from a fantastic Dananananacroid gig I saw last now, night Now, they're supposed to be good. Have we ever played them? Yeah. We, oh, oh, maybe we haven't played them on this show, actually. They are supposed to be I good. I keep reading about them. They're noise nicks. The gig was marred by a terrible Stephen mo- moment when the lead singer, Callum, said Stephen in between songs and there was no Just Coming response. No. As I, for one, was caught off guard. However, it seemed to me that if a singer in a band is shouting out Stephen during a gig, then the whole phenomenon has gone too far. Should it not be brought to a close and assigned to its rightful place as no, part of no. cult Adam and Joe history? No. I would say that when singers in bands start that's saying it... That's when it's it, starting to reach its apex. Yeah, that's yeah, when that's it's a tipping. Good thing. We've had the Fleet Foxes are in there. They're on the Stephen bandwagon. Now yeah. we've got the Dan and Anna Nacroids in there. Somebody from Hatcham Social sent me a video. I think his name is Ian. I'm not sure the bassist in Hatcham Social. Right. Sent me a video of a gig in Berlin 
where uh, the audience are uh, Stevening. Or are they Stevening? I'll have another look at it. Wow. But that's action in Berlin. That's pretty good. I was thinking we should step it up a notch. I was thinking we would have a world map on our website and it would be like sightings of some rare species of bird. International Stevenage. Yeah, and you would have a little thing on the website that showed you and you'd put the cursor on it and up would come a little description of the Steven, where it was heard and the circum... And, you know, you could get... You could get nectar points, mm. Adam and Joe points so, for um, for you know getting a Stephen in a really outlandish location because we've had what we've had New York in a museum in New York. Yeah, uh, we've definitely had Paris. We've had Berlin. Uh, we've had some far flung Stevens. We'll we'll look in our archives. I'm and, sure there must be one in it. We, a few people listening in Australia. Yeah, uh, so we yeah. definitely had some Antipodean ones. I like it. We're talking with the BBC about refreshing our website, listeners. We're going to maybe have a new website mm. with uh, with a blog and stuff. Um, we're not quite sure what sort of stuff it'll have on it, but it'll be improved, and maybe that could be one of the features. Yeah. So we're not shutting it down. We're ramping it up. It's all in the pipe. I mean, we but do. We I'm do on this from it. <laughs> yes, we do on this program like to make outrageous claims and promises, and then not necessarily follow through immediately. But that's just the way we roll. Yeah. Yeah, it'll happen. All right, so sit tight. Thanks very much for all your Stephen news. Here we have a bit of music now from the wonderful Eels. This is Susan's House. That's very nice, isn't it? That's uh, Eels with Susan's House. We were talking about lookalikes the other week, weren't we? Oh, yeah. And we were asking listeners when they emailed us to tell us who they looked like so we can imagine them as um, sexy celebrities. Who was the footballer you were supposed to look like? To- Fernando Torres. Fernando Torres. Yeah. Is well, not supposed to look like. Do look very like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the face, not so much, but the, the body. <laughs> the ball skills. Yeah, it's the skilled ball skills. <laughs> um, and a lot of people have emailed saying that I, Joe Cornish, bear a facial resemblance to Nicholas Rowe, who played Sherlock Holmes. The in young Sherlock. Young Sherlock Holmes and the Pyramid of Fear. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, we've really had a lot of emails, so I, that's why I felt I should say it to acknowledge... And I am aware of that. Mm. Um, I'm not that happy about it. Why not? Well, he's a funny-looking chap. Slightly beaky nose. Yeah, I've got a slightly beaky nose. And, you know, I auditioned for that film. That's right, you did. They came to our school. You even lied about getting the And they auditioned, yeah. And this is a story I've told before, but I'll tell it again quickly. I auditioned for it. Uh, I didn't get a part in it, even though our English teacher at school thought that I would, so I got very excited. Yeah. I was so disappointed at not getting the part. I was too young, basically. I was only about 14, and mm-hmm. I think Nicholas Rowe was a, is a little older than me. He's not beaky enough. Yes, <laughs> not enough of a beak. Um, <laughs> You're looking for more of a beak. But, so, there is a hairdresser near me, near Vauxhall in South London, called Tingles. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and I'd driven past Tingles, and I was going through a particularly poncy 80s phase, and I decided I'd visit Tingles, so I went into Tingles to have my hair done. Uh, Tingles is still there on the Clapham I th- Road. I think it is, yeah, yeah Tingles. And um, I only ever went there once because I told the hairdresser at Tingles that I was in Young Sherlock Holmes and the Pyramid of Fear. <laughs> and I didn't want to say that I was playing Holmes because I thought she might see it and realise. So I told her she was playing Moriarty. You were playing Moriarty. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was playing Moriarty, sorry. Who I don't think is in the film. <laughs> I'm not sure Moriarty is in the film in the end. Yeah. Uh, but this is like a lot of the stories people sent us about things you did to be cool yes. last week. But that's a thing I tried to do to be cool. I lied about getting a part in the film. Nice bit of lying. Yeah, and I've never been back to Tingles since. And still, every time I drive past Tingles, I get a little tingle <laughs> of guilt <laughs> <laughs> that there might be a disappointed hairdresser in there. She's still I've got watched a- it a hundred times. I still can't see him. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture of you up in the window now. Even though now that listeners say I look like Nicholas Rowe, maybe mm. she saw it and Oh, he was lying about being Moriarty. He was the lead. <laughs> he just got a stage name, Nicholas Rowe. That's right. Oh, it's the Beaky fella. Yes, I, I put his um, I put his son Mr. in. Mr. Beaks. I did his highlights. His son in. <laughs> I made him look like the man from Flock of Seagulls from China Crisis. <laughs> from China, the man from Flock of Seagulls from China Crisis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just switched the band, the reference there. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to catch up with a bit more textination so- shortly, sh- shortly. But first, here's a free play for you right now. This is Simeon, and this is a band. This is one of those bands. They had a a, a, a very distinctive debut album called chemistry is what we are which was very woozy and psychedelic lots of lovely harmonies that's one of the tracks i'm going to play you strange time signatures that kind of thing and then they sort of went off and their next album i think was the one that yielded the track we are your friends right uh which was remixed maybe with by uh, justice 
and it sounded totally different like a hundred percent different and i'm not sure it I, d- I don't know how it did for them i guess it did quite well but to me it wasn't really to my taste i liked early simeon the woozy psychedelic simeon maybe a band member left or something and and took all the all the psychedelic stuff with him i don't know what happened but no offense to the uh simeon chaps that remained but i really liked the early incarnation and this is one of those tracks from that album chemistry is what we are this is called orange glow smart fart you know, one of the nice things about doing a radio show or, or anything on in the p- sort of public eye vaguely mm-hmm. or like a tiny section of a tiny portion of the public's ear yep. is that sometimes uh, people from bands that you really uh, admire or famous people like listen to it, right? Mm-hmm. That was what was really nice about doing the Adam and Joe show on telly years ago. Mm-hmm. Like people, uh, people that we really admired suddenly have something to sort of identify you with, right? And it was exciting that the Bunny Man, yeah, Will Sargent, listening, and I, I get excited that Tom Robinson listens to this program. He's obviously a six music DJ, yeah, but he's a fan of the show, and he sent us a very nice email, didn't he? He was trying to help out with, uh, he was trying to prove that there was a supportive Twitter community out there, which I know, you know, I'm just still getting my head around twittering. That's all, yeah. But I still appreciate that. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And what have we got something to plug of Tom's? Yeah, well, that's... yeah, Art Brute. Do you say Art Brute or Art Brew? Brute, How would you I say think. Brute, yeah. Art Brute. They are playing on his show. They're doing a session for him. And uh, when are they doing it, Joe Cornish? They are doing it next Friday from 7 pm. And their new album, I think I'm right in saying, is produced by Frank Black. Wow, really? X of the Pixies, now calling himself black francis again but uh I, i'm i'm not 100 percent right so it's probably that. not no i'm pretty sure really yeah. i'm just thinking on on past record you right know, of getting things right <laughs> throwing the gauntlet down i'm gonna that's <laughs> galvanized me into checking my facts it also, is no, charlotte we've got two things right charlotte says that is correct i was I'm, correct about moonraker being made in 79 was it 79 yeah. okay uh so we're gonna play a bit of art brute for you right now this is alcoholics unanimous <laughs> Text the nation. Text, text, text. Text the nation. What if I don't want to? Text the nation. It doesn't matter. Text. That was the the with this is the day that you heard just before that uh, slightly contracted text the nation jingle. And we're going to wrap up our text the nation this week, which, let me remind you, was all about dreadful auditions stroke job interviews that you've been involved with in your life terrible stories inspired by the fact that uh, i actually had a nice audition yesterday but i've had a number of pretty atrocious ones in my life where i've more or less made a phenomenal dobber of myself in a number of inventive ways <laughs> and come out <laughs> phenomenal dobber <laughs> yeah and come out feeling fairly humble uh mm. thereafter so you know we were asking you for for similar anecdotes you got anything there joe i certainly have here's one from a person have you ever met any people you know i'm a people person myself really so, so you, you love them i make it my so business to I. meet I as them. many of them as i can hi guys my favorite interview story concerns my friend rich who went along to his cambridge university interview and when the academic offered him his outstretched hand to shake rich thought he was offering to take his coat and dumped it on his hand <laughs> bad one he tried to redeem it at the end by saying merry christmas instead of <laughs> goodbye it was october he didn't get in <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's bad because once you start getting rattled in those situations, things keep rattling. It's a weird world, isn't it? You enter into yeah. when you step into a room like that. The all bets are off. The rules have changed. Normal, natural behaviour isn't what's expected. It's a ritualised uh, arena mm. with its own codified rules. And you have to keep playing by those rules, even if the temptation is to sort of cut through all the crap. But the thing is, no one's quite sure what those rules are. No. Uh, but we're going some way to finding out what they could be through your brilliant texts. Nicely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Thanks, that mate. was a brilliant little uh, segue there. Yeah. It's uh, nice. Here's another one from Alex in London. Um, I've never had much success in interviews, but one embarrassment is still particularly painful to recall. While at university in London, I decided I needed a summer job, applied for a telesales position in a, at a firm in Acton. Trekked all the way up there, found the grotty industrial estate. I was already having second thoughts. Times were tough, needed the job. Interview went okay. The man seemed as if he was going to offer me the job. He certainly had something on his mind that he seemed anxious to tell me. Do you mind if I make an observation? He inquired. Not at all, I replied, expecting some helpful, friendly tip on interview technique. Well, he went on, has anyone ever told you you look a lot like Andrew Lloyd Webber? (laughs) 
<laughs> I was furious since the Lloyd Webber look was not one I have been purposefully <laughs> cultivating, and I'm aware he is not considered a classical beauty well, by most. By some, he's a b- bizarre Doctor Who kind hey, of hey, a hey, he's hey, very hey, handsome. Whoa, whoa, he's whoa, a very whoa. handsome, talented, Rewind. beautiful man. Thank you. With a lovely Thank face, you he does very not much look like Davros. Are you co- because basically you would be impugning the judgment of Sarah Brightman and I know, other I know, which women. would be horrific. And you know, he doesn't look like Stavros's fat uncle. <laughs> um, I was furious. Yeah, blah blah blah. Anyway, I declined the I, I declined the offered job on the basis of hurt pride. Oh, so that's him declining a job because of something misguided the interviewer said. Right, too frivolous. I mean, I would that that's my dream. One day, I'm going to have sufficient confidence in my life and the things that really matter that I'm going to stand up in an embarrassing yep. audition situation. I'm going to go. You know what? I just don't need this. See ya. And now this good wait. Come see ya. Come back. No one's ever talked to us That's like right. that before. That's right. You're amazing. Yes, you can have the job, Dr. Buckles. Oh, thank you, it worked. Thank you very much. When do I start? <laughs> oh, no, you've lost it again. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you've got it again. You know what? I don't need this. Yeah, you got it again. Hooray! Lost it. Oh, you know what? I don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> Long interview. <laughs> uh, I don't need this. Here's one from another person. Oh, there's a lot of people out there. I went to a job interview... <laughs> <laughs> last year in Canary Wharf. It was going really well until they asked me, what's your biggest regret? Oh, what? What kind I of I thought job? about it a bit and started to cry. Oh, my goodness. Whoops. I didn't get the job. But sorry, that's from John in Bethnal Green. John. <laughs> you know what? That's a bit sexist <laughs> of me, but I was imagining that at least it was a woman. A woman. Because, w- because women do tend to cry. It's a medical <laughs> fact. Uh, a bit more easily than oh, men. come, come. But John... <laughs> What are you doing having a little weep in the Sorry. middle of the job interview? Hey, men cry as well. Of course they do, but it doesn't happen they quite so much. They just cry tears of stone. There's all kinds of physiological reasons why that's so. I can give you quite a boring book about really? it. Really? Yeah. Uh, here's one from Nick White. My mate went for a job that required fluent French, and although he only had GCSE grade C, he said on his CV that he was fluent good bit of lying the interview went a bit like this <laughs> hi andrew uh, as you know this post requires a fluent french speaker so if you don't mind we'll be conducting the rest of the interview in french oh. at which point he reeled off in perfectly fluid french a lengthy first question after a bit of a dramatic pause andrew calmly responded with uh i know i said i spoke <laughs> french but actually i don't so if it's okay with you i'm gonna leave now <laughs> good work that must have happened a bit though surely and the, the interviewers must have been just having a ball <laughs> anna would, in hackney would you have tried to bluff it a bit with your school oui, je, je parle french fluemment un moment un moment um, uh, uh, au revoir <laughs> then run out. Here's one from Anna in Hackney. When I was about 15, I applied for a job in a chemist. The interview form had a bit on it where it asked why I wanted to work in a chemist. I said it was because I liked the smell of chemists. <laughs> I wasn't joking or anything. I-, I meant that nice chemically smell. I don't think it painted me in the best light. I never heard back. No, that is a weird thing to say because it makes you sound like some kind of special serial killer person. Yeah. I like the smell of chemists. It is a nice smell, though. What? It's just a, a reassuring smell. You know you're close to being cured. Do you like the smell of hospitals too, then? No. Why is that different? Well, it's chemists are more upbeat because they're about, you know... Minor the, ailments. Yeah, minor ailments and the cure. And right, it right. reminds me of childhood, you know, in your pushchair in the chemist. Sure. Uh, anyway, you want another one? Yeah, go on, give us one more to wrap it up. One more. Uh, hi, I went for a job as an HGV fitter and the foreman directed me into an office. Uh, this is from Jonathan Banks. But what I thought he said was, follow me. So I went behind him down a corridor, then realised he was going to the toilet. (laughs) As he opened the door to the gents, he turned and saw me directly behind him. Unsuccessful. (laughs) (laughs) Says John. (laughs) I like that. Here we go. One more, one more. Okay. This is from Claire Rice. A friend of mine just told me she auditioned for theatre school with a dramatic monologue. They asked her to perform it as if she was being arrested. Right, this is good for you. Yes, taking notes. She struggled against a fake police officer and her top came down. She wasn't wearing a bra. She got into the school. (laughs) You see, that is what it comes down to, isn't it? There you go. That's all you need to know about auditions, interviews, life, the universe. Pop your top off. And everything. Pop your top off, love. In you come. (laughs) Job's yours. (laughs) Was Adam Buxton speaking? No, of course it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't Adam Buxton. No, that was um, Roger... I was in character. Donald. Yes, Roger Donald. 
<laughs> he's a yeah another you DJ. You know what? I don't need this job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you've got it. You're hired. Hooray! <laughs> You're fine. Oh, I do. No, I don't need it. Uh, okay, here's Paul Weller. No, no, it's not Paul Weller. It's Gold and Silvers with True Romance, or is it the other way around? Yeah. Go on. What? Watch the video online now. Okay. Um, oh, um, is that you pretending That's to the watch sound it? of me watching. Ah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like... <laughs> no, it, it sounds, sounds like, like different, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. It sounds yeah. like you're inside the lavatory. <laughs> you know, I've been having a terrible time with technology recently. Right. Right. And about a year ago, I signed on for a, uh, a service that uh, Macintosh provide if you have a Mac computer. It's a kind of internet thing that you Has can it must have a groovy up. name i can't remember what, what they changed the name i think it was i think it was a mac dot account or something like that right and it enabled you to sync all your photos in space and i don't know i was having a little um insecure moment and a friend of mine says you haven't got a mac dot me account oh you've got to get one it makes your life brilliant and so easy and fantastic okay i'll get one okay me 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 so i immediately sign on for one at a cost of around 70 quid for about Whoa. for a year's worth right never used it never never not once used it mm. uh immediately forgot the password and all that kind of stuff and uh, you know didn't make a proper note of it and then i was reminded that it existed a month or so ago when i got an email saying uh your mobile me account is now about to be renewed because it's mac dot changed its name to change its name to mobile me in the process mm. apparently becoming much less good than it was before according to my friend this is just the opinion of my friend but uh so I'm thinking, oh, no, they're going to renew the account of this thing that I don't use. OK, I've got to go and cancel it. So I go to try and cancel it. Right. Mm. And, and it's asking me for my password and my login name, none of which I have. So it says, forgot your password. Yeah, I have forgotten my password. So I click on the thing, takes me to a website where I can put in a new password and stuff. Your, you know, notification will be emailed to you shortly. Great. OK, so I've got my new password. Then I go back to login. Login name. I, haven't, I don't know what my login name is. So I try all the obvious ones. Adam Buxton, etc. You know, capitalize the A's and the B's and all that kind of stuff. Nothing works. I can't log in. And there's no there's no thing saying you know forgotten your login name as well you think it's tricky git? isn't it that the number of secret passwords and numbers you have to have to yeah. operate in society in the modern world right. it's becoming absolutely ridiculous well the upshot is that i failed to cancel the account and they, now they're charging you for another 70 they, quid yeah ah, it just renewed part of the, i got strategy. an email saying congratulations you've renewed for another year of a, a, a service not only that i have never used and will never use but i can't access well welcome because to I britain can, i in can't the even get on it it's the same with mobile phone companies isn't it if yeah. you don't cancel your contract they, they you just it just perpetuates right. infinitely and there's you know there's a phone number there's a help line number that you can call but their office hours are completely out of sync with mine yeah so i'm never around during their office hours and then if you did finally get through i would imagine the conversation would go something like um i don't know have you written down your login details no that's why i'm calling uh um no i don't know it would go like that and then i would be possibly i'm possibly. just speculating you could go yes mr buxton that's thanks right. a lot for calling we thanks very much for your... calling mobile me no problem if you want to leave the service that's absolutely fine We're okay here's your login details right pounds now. for leaving and another 150 pounds for compensation for your trouble <laughs> that's right you never know worth a try uh, this is a record by the police. Uh, it's called Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic. Uh, that's the police with Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic. It's the end of our show now. We'll be back with you live next Saturday from... No, will we? No, we won't. That's a terrible, terrible lie. That is an absolute lie because we're pre-recording our show. It's Easter Saturday, show. yeah. We yeah. did sort of a slightly uh, unusually disastrous pre-record the other day. If you want to hear a couple of men more or less running on fumes... At the end of their tethers, then listen to next <laughs> week's show. Uh, yeah, and uh, you remember there'll be a podcast on Tuesday or you can listen to the show again live on the BBC iPlayer. Stay tuned for Liz Kershaw. Take care. Have a good week. Thanks for texting and emailing. Bye. BBC Six. Music.